You've seen him at the Smith Center, and now, today, he's here on Locked on Tar Heels. Be that the unofficial sixth man of the Tar Heels. Where on earth does he get all that energy from? We're going to find out on today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, June 3rd, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget that we are free and available anywhere you get podcasts, and so right now, if you would, subscribe to the show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay, friends, B Dot, the man, is joining us here on the show today. Let's get right into it. Oh boy, we are joined today on Locked on Tar Heels by the man himself, B Dot. B Dot, what's up, homie? What's happening with you, Isaac, man? You good? I'm so good, but I want to be where you are. It looks beautiful there. Hey, listen, man. I, you know, I, I happen to have friends, you know, that have some that stay in some nice neighborhoods. So <laughs> I was like, you know, I might as well just come outside. You can hear the birds. We all waking up together. It's <laughs> some nice solace out here, man. I like to come out here and get my mind together in the morning. I love it. Yeah, those birds are going to bring a nice little peaceful soundtrack to our conversation. Yeah. That's awesome. Nice little ambiance <laughs> we're doing here today, Ozzy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I do, man. I do. So uh, for those of you who are listening, you don't see this, but for those of you watching, you know, B- B-Dot, you don't have your hat on today. What's going on? Man, uh, some mismanaging, some some time mismanagement. <laughs> I will actually left it at the house because, see, you got to understand, the, the six-man crown you know, it, it goes away until there's a reason to bring it out. So I'm not in the habit of just having it out and have, I need to put one in maybe a different location. The wife tells me I need to put one in my car so that therefore, whenever something like this arises, I'll be straight. I might have to take her up on that, but my, I have three six man crowns <laughs> and all three of them are at the house in the back cave. Yeah, dude, you, you need to, you got to update how your logistics on that. You got to get that squared away. Agree, agree. But I am not my, <laughs> like like the song that came out, I am not my hair. I am not my hat, okay? I am the guy okay. that the crown, when you see the crown, you have to understand that we are full throttle Tar Heel time. You understand? Like, yeah, I'm at work, I'm getting it in. Right now, I'm just kicking it with my man Isaac, just talking about some cool things. But I definitely should have had the crown with me next uh-huh. time. I will definitely have the crown on my way. Done. Done. It's like when you put it on, you just feel this different energy that inhabits Legit. your body. <laughs> Legit. It's well, six-man. It's six-man energy. And I'm telling you, Isaac, I really, really felt that in New Orleans. When I was in New Orleans, when I was walking down Bourbon Street, when I had my hat on, it was Superman. When I took the hat <laughs> off, it was Clark Kent. And Clark I'm telling Kent. you, I could... <laughs> I was walking, nobody, I was just a black guy walking down the street. But the moment I put my hat on, it was six man B Dot, and they love me, even though my name is pronounced B Dot. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> it's the B hat for the B Dot. Hey, um, B hat so- for B Dot. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, Jack. <laughs> so, um, look, I want to go back and um, just. I'm assuming people that are tuning into this know who you are. They've seen you in the Smith Center or seen you in all these other various venues. But just to make sure everybody knows who the man is, you you just talked about your wife. So if you would, like, just tell us a little bit about about your family, who you are. Um, I'm uh, married, what, eight years now, February 1st, 2014. Um, my wife and I, um, we got married in Greensboro, North Carolina. Beautiful wedding. Um, at that time, we had already had my son, um, Isaiah, who um, at that time was, what, eight. And my daughter, who at that time was two. And, um, of course, like many marriages, our kids were in the wedding. So, you know, that was always fun. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll connect the dots. You know, that's my brand. I'm a brand creator. So um, one of my brands that I have created is Connect the Dots. And um, symbolic for us is February 1st, 2014. Not just the date that we got married, but the numbers actually mean something. Again, it's four of us. So um, 2-1 is when two became one. That's February 1st. 
and then 14 is when that one became four because it was the four of us connect the dots me carla isaiah and ryan so two one one four is two became one one became four um and that's just you know connect the dots that's our mantra we're, we're, we're a foursome and we, and we stick together and um, we have social media outlets and my daughter actually just got her first brand placement with our uh, monkey ruse pajamas so um, if anybody <laughs> likes pajamas they have kids through adults please go to monkey ruse um, and grab some pajamas and use the code Ryan, R-I-Y-E-N, um, because she's a brand ambassador. And, you know, I'm just, you know, I, I'm building with my family as I build with my own personal brand. And, you know, um, you know, I, I don't know, like I, I'm, I'm real. Um, family values are, are, are very important to me. You know, uh, my mother is here in Greensboro um, where I am now. And my sister is in Atlanta and my brother is in Virginia. So we're spread out. Um, but, you know, we try to get together as much as possible and love on each other and, you know, building relationships with our with our families, our, you know, our nieces and nephews can chill with each other and stuff like that. You know, it's just building. But um, I'm real family oriented. Just celebrated a 57th birthday for my um, auntie. It was her very first birthday party that she's had as an adult. So all the family got together and celebrated her in Charlotte. I'm just real big on family, man. Like just I, I was growing up. I can never be in a room by myself. Like if you want to torture me, put me in a room by myself, you know, but <laughs> you put me in a room with people like that's where I thrive. And, and that's why I've been so successful in my career because I'm, 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 I'm great with people. I love that. So wh where does B dot come from? Where, where did you pick up that nickname? College, college, man. My freshman year in college, uh, my man, Rico, Rico was dot dollars. And at that time, everybody was dot something because the dot com um, was, was, was really popping. So like, you know, like, I don't know how old this audience is that's watching, but there was a time, believe it or not, where <laughs> dot com was not the norm. Okay? Like, right. I'm a product. I'm a product of the 90s. You dig like 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 I was a teenager in the 90s. I was teen yes. in the 90s. So when we got to 2000, like everything was dot com, this dot com, that. So I had a homie who was from New York. His name was dot com. Like that's what he named himself, dot com. And that's what we called him. What up, dot com? What up, dot com? Um, another one of my friends named Rico, his name was Dot Dollars. You know what I'm saying? Dot Dollars. What's up, Dot Dollars? So one day we were all just chilling and he said, Man, you should be B dot. Like it's a bunch of B's, man, but you should just be B dot. You can't be B dot com because there's already a dot com. And B dot com is <laughs> that's just too much. But you should just be B dot. And I was like, All right, I, I like B dot. And I couldn't spell it D-O-T. Cause they just seem too normal and I'm just a very eclectic individual. So, um, the O I changed for the phonetic spelling of a H, which is ah. <laughs> so the D A H T dot and B dot stuck. And it's been there for 22 years, man. And you know, it's, it's just interesting because even off B dot, I can tell what people know me from where, like people that usually a lot of times when, um, the Carolina family scream my name, they call me B dat. <laughs> be that be that so that lets me know that they've just seen the name somewhere they haven't heard the pronunciation of it um so that i know that who, where that group comes from a lot of times and then you have friend, people that um always refer to me as b dot and that's the equivalent of me referring to you as isaac shade imagine every time i talk to this like so isaac shade let me ask you this <laughs> no i just say isaac you know what i'm saying like so people that call me dot people that just say hey yo dot hey dot i know that those are people that more times than not, those people know me, know me because they're calling me by my nickname Dot versus my professional name, which is B Dot. If B -Dot. that makes sense, absolutely it does. Does it like where, where do you hear Brian? Does your mom still call you? Like if you're in trouble, do you get Brian? Nah, Brian is called by police officers and, and judges <laughs> in court. Court is the only time I hear Brian. Brian, could you please? Are you yeah? Continuance, like that's what I hear. Brian. Nah, my mom she calls me Dot. Like, I, like I think all my family calls me Dot. Every okay. now and then, people that want to prove that they've known me since middle school, they'll Brian. I knew you before B Dot. I'm not calling you no B Dot. You're Brian. So those people, okay, and then that happens from time to time. But um, most most people call me Dot. Dude. I feel that because because yeah, yeah. of my last name being Shade, I've I've gotten Slim Shady my whole life, and so the oh, close people legit. just they just call me Slim. The close people, so I'm tracking with you, dude. I, even though I'm not, but I get it. I dig though. See, like, so if somebody <laughs> if you're in a room and somebody just yells out, "Hey, Slim," 
you know they know you from a period of time. You know what I'm saying? And if somebody says, hey, Isaac Shade, you know that they know you from your profession. You see what I'm saying? That's like, right. it's crazy Absolutely. like that. It's crazy yeah. like that. That's so fun. So um, something I I love about you and appreciate about you is I feel like so many um, personalities and people out there have to project this. I know everything and I've got life all figured out. But I, I love that you are very willing to admit ignorance about a subject or a topic. Um, and, and we see that through this podcast that you've done. I don't know. Maybe you didn't either. And some other things right. like that. Why is that important for you to to be able to be willing to express when you don't know something and then to help educate people? Well, I think that debates educate. And I feel like the only way you can really, really learn is if you're understanding that you don't know everything and you're willing to get that knowledge. Like there's one there's one thing to know that you don't know something and that's fine. But until you reach that point where you're actually willing to learn or wanting to learn, then you're really doing yourself a disservice. And I've always found power in ignorance in the idea that. Um, yes, you know, you lose a little bit because, oh, you didn't know that? That's, there's always that audience. <laughs> you didn't know that? You know, like, but then everybody, you know, every <laughs> what Clubhouse showed us is that everybody loves to be uh, an expert, right? So if I'm vulnerable and I say, hey, I don't know this, then that gives you an opportunity to be an expert and educate me. Now, it's my turn at that point to go do my own due diligence and see if what you educated me on was BS or fact, but it's giving you that platform to be that. And I don't mind giving people that platform because it only makes me stronger and it lessens some of the work that I have to do because I <laughs> learn better from conversations and debate versus reading in a text and my ADD kicks in and the words start jumping off the page and now I got to listen to an audio book, but then we start driving this and action and I got to rewind 30 seconds. There's just too much going on. But if we're having a debate or conversation, it prints better for me. So being mm. able to have those conversations and that dialogue, like it's just strong. And I did 17 years on um, morning radio at 102 Jams and I never wanted to come off as the all knowing because I'm not. And the most dangerous thing you can do in life is come off as all knowing because when you when they realize that you don't know your credibility is shot and mm. i would rather go in under the assumption that i don't know diddly and you have to educate me and i said oh i did know that actually and then we can combat in that conversation versus me going in feeling like i already know all the answers and then that may put you in a position where you don't even want to share certain things because you feel like i already know it um, so, you know, the, the, the more vulnerable I am and the more transparent I am in the things that I don't know, I've gained strength from those. Um, a lot of times I was just doing it because it was my personality. Um, after the, a couple of years of therapy, I realized that it was essential, you know, to be transparent and to be vulnerable in certain situations. So it just works out for me, man. But, you know, even with the I didn't know, maybe you didn't either on um, podcast. I, that was just very ignorant. Um just things that I did not know uh, about mm. America. Like I honestly did not know that Christopher Columbus was such a heinous individual. I did yeah. not know. Like, you know, when we're taught about him in school, he's Superman. Like this dude, if it was not for Christopher Columbus, we wouldn't have any of these freedoms that we have today. Like he found America for us and, <laughs> and he came in and there were people living here and they respected Christopher Columbus so much that they said, listen, you can have our land. And, and he made a better America for us. And, that ain't how it went at all, baby. Like, that ain't it. Like, like Christopher Columbus was like Hitler. He was like Stalin. Like, he came and took land from people who lived here by killing them because he had weapons that they couldn't use. And to celebrate that, Columbus has a whole freaking holiday that we celebrate <laughs> in the United States. And, and, and honestly, that's where it started for me. And... From there, I read the um, the history of the United States, and that was like a 19-hour audio book. But just reading things in there that I just never knew, and just I was very transparently. It all started with me just having conversations with my friends. Like, did y'all know that Christopher Columbus was one of the meanest people to ever walk the earth? <laughs> and they're like, nah, I didn't know that. And I'm like, I didn't know, shoot, maybe you didn't either. I just wanted to share it. And from there, the very, <laughs> very vulnerable <clears throat> title stuck with itself i didn't know maybe you didn't either and that title has become so 
strong for people because like you said like it, it, it is that vulnerability and that that transparency of i don't know and if you listen to it and you do know you're like oh i knew that one i did know that one you know like <laughs> that's cool now your job is to share it with somebody else because guess what somebody else didn't know it and the, the thought process that we're all supposed to be under the same um learning curve or we're all supposed to know the exact same information is 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 detrimental you know, because there's no way that that's possible. The way that Slim was brought up is totally different from the way that Doc was brought up. But I won't know how Slim was brought up unless Slim and I have a conversation and he is is confident enough to share his viewpoints. And I'm, um, I'm receptive enough to listen to those viewpoints yeah. and then share my viewpoints. And yeah. there's that there's that, that, that area of of. Um, uh, maliciousness that, that that's not in the air because we're just having a good conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like so many times people throw out different things and it comes off so malicious in intent that the receiver isn't receptive of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, but yep, there absolutely. needs to be conversations with with us. And like, I love talking to my man, Josh Graham, because he and I have conversations that normally people would feel, oh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> you don't talk about black and white. We have to talk about black and yes, white, man. Like, absolutely. And, you know, there's power. Absolutely. In that. Absolutely. And and I love that you went there because that was my very next question is um, I think in this country, there is this feeling of like we have to stay away from race conversations. But I think that's precisely how we don't grow and precisely how we don't get closer together. So for for me as a white man, let, let me be the white audience. How is it um, appropriate or helpful for me to engage with a podcast like that where it's learning more about the, the black heritage and black culture or how you and I would have conversations about that? Well, I'm reading a book right now called um, uh, Difficult Conversations with a Black Boy. I think that's the name of it. Difficult Conversations with a Black Boy. And it's really just that right there. I honestly would think that all white people should listen to or read that hmm. book. Nice. And I say that because it breaks it down on the most fundamental level. Like it shows how the systemic divide and it shows how the racism was implemented in laws. Like you got to think about a time where we go by the constitution and we live our lives by the constitution, but the constitution was written in 1776. Black people <laughs> weren't free until 1865. So in that 110 years, that's a 110 year head start that the white race has over the black race. And you can't put someone in a box for hundreds of years and then take them out the box while you've had 400 year head start and then say, all right, it's even, let's go. Like that's just not realistically fair, right? Yeah. And I think that until, until white people can understand that and until white people can understand their privilege and it's not saying, and, and, and again, when people, and, when some white people hear white privilege, they immediately get um, turned off because they, they, they feel like what we're saying is you got life easy. Your life mm. is easy because you're white. And that's not what we're saying at all. White privilege really means that the difficulties you've had in life have not been because of your race. Mm. And black people, we can't say that. A lot of the difficulties we have, a lot of the bars that have been set are because are a hundred percent race influence like when 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 laws were first given um in this book i'm reading where it breaks it down and and, my, and the reason i started reading it is because my son is in a reading um, class in high school um and they have to do summer reading and he's in a group where they um because the school he goes to is predominantly white school and they mm -hmm. have a group where you know the the, the boys of uh, color um they allow them to be in a group. You have to have certain grades and, and, and certain um, demands on you. And they're the um, Kings Becoming Kings. I think that's the, the name of the group. Nice. And they have a summer reading um, program. And that's a book that they have to read. And the parents, we have to read a book by Michael Eric D um, Dyson. But in this book, it's just breaking down again um, the, 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 the birth of a nation. You know, the very first feature film. Right. And in this very first feature film, the, the, the plot is um, black guys who are dre who are white guys in blackface. Right. Black guys terrorizing the city, you know, and these white vigilantes have to cover themselves, the Klan and defend the city. 
And, you know, this movie was the very first feature film in the history of feature films. Like it was a huge film, but it automatically categorized black people, men specifically, as just angry and as just tyrants. And, you know, many of lives have been lost to the tears of a white woman. You know, mm -hmm. black people say that all the time. And you, you reference stories like Emmett Till, you know, like she just like like this woman said that Emmett Till whistled at her, grabbed her. And these two men killed Emmett Till, um, strapped him to barbed wire and threw him over into the river and to the mm -hmm. to the point where he was unrecognizable. And then about five, six years ago, she admitted that she was lying. But that's the fear that black people have that white people don't necessarily have. Like white people don't necessarily have the fear of um, because the way your name is spelled, someone may not give you a job. Um, um, the way that you wear your hair or the way that you talk you may not get a job or you may not be able to get approved for this home loan and things of that nature. And, you know, that's all systemic. And I really think those conversations need to be had because the more they are had, the more white people understand black people and the more black people understand white people, because the Klan is a small amount. The Klan is a super small amount, but because they are so loud and divisive and so heinous in their acts, that it's magnified to, to maximum proportions. Yeah. Oh, man, there are a whole bunch more conversations we need to have in this, folks. Agreed. Dot, Dot, thank you so much for um, your willingness to be transparent and, and to have those conversations. And that is how we become more united and gathered together as a people. Right. Well, uh, man, right. we've had some heavy conversations. Right. It's about I time to I talk about some. Talking about Tar Heel basketball and Matthew Meyer not coming. Next thing you know, we're talking about Christopher Columbus being Stalin. <laughs> That's what happens when you rock with the six man, baby. <laughs> Woo! I love it. I love it so much. But for real, it's time to do that. But before we get into talking about why didn't Matthew Meyer come to Carolina and who is B. Dot the six man, first let me tell you a little bit about Bet Online. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. So find all the latest odds, news, sports developments, including the NBA playoffs, which started last night, MLB scores, fights, and even this upcoming season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering info, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. So head to the website today or gr grab your mobile device to learn more about all the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. Hey, we are joined on today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels by the man B-Dot. You can just call him Dot. Ain't no need to give his full name. Exactly. And <laughs> now we need to move into talking about the Tar Heels, big in a big way. So, Dot, first off, where, where did your Tar Heel fandom come from? How did that happen? Um, a line drawn in the sand, like many kids, um, you know, in North Carolina. When you're in school, they bring that big old TV into the room during the ACC tournament, and you have to pick a side. And I moved to North Carolina in the fourth grade from St. Louis, Missouri. And when I moved here in the fourth grade, um, you know, you just had to pick a blue. Like nobody was wearing <laughs> red or orange or, you know, none of that. People rooting for Florida State in football. But as far as basketball, you pick the blue. And the Carolina blue was just always better. And like I, I told him on the ACC network, like my parents, like my dad is a, is a pastor. We grew up in the church. I could never root for a devil or a demon deacon <laughs> or anything <laughs> foolish like that. Like I had to I had to give my life to God. And when I did that, I looked up. And I saw the Carolina blue skies today. And there you go. Carolina blue for me, man. And I've been a fan ever since fourth grade um, at Wiley Elementary School. My very first game I went to was um, February 10th, I believe, 2008. And we were playing Clemson. And my, my girlfriend then, now my wife, uh, she bought me my very first tickets to the Dean Smith Center and we played Clemson and I think we beat Clemson in like double overtime. Tyler Hansborough had like a crazy game. Like it was unreal. <laughs> and like for that to be your first game ever watching live, like I've been, oh God, I was like, no, no feeling is ever going to top this feeling. <laughs> Little did I know that just, you know, 14 years later, I will be on the uh, Dean Smith, uh, Dean Smith Center floor 
uh, getting 21,000 fans lit. So I, I had no clue what was ahead of me. But um, that 2008 game, that's actually where I bought the hat, my, my, my six-man crown. I was in the concourse, and I saw, and I think it was maybe like 30 bucks or something, and I was like, yo, this is awesome. I could wear this everywhere. And I bought it, and <laughs> I did. I wore it to all, like, I, whenever – Carolina would come play in the Greensboro um, Coliseum in the ACC tournament. I would have it when they played in the um, the, the, the regionals where Creighton did that heinous act to uh, Kendall Marshall. I was right there behind the band with my hat on. Um, like I, I, That hat has gone with me everywhere. I actually um, performed stand-up in uh, Miami on this series called Comedy After Dark with um, Walter Latham. Walter Latham is the guy who put together the um, Kings of Comedy. And he put together a platform in Miami called um, Comedy After Dark. And it was my first time ever being flown out somewhere to do comedy and being put up in a room and paid for it. I felt like a big deal. But <laughs> at that show, when I walk out, they introduced me, b dot, And I come out and I got the hat and I sit the hat. I take the mic off and I put the hat on the mic stand and I do my jokes. And after my jokes, I put the mic down. I hold my Carolina Tar Heel hat up. And I leave the stage, and people still talk about that now. Now that, that had to be 2009, maybe 2010. So that had to be a good. That was over a decade ago, and people still yes. talk about that. Yeah, that yes. has gone everywhere, Shade. I love it. So now, as you said, you've gone from just kicking it in the stands with everybody else and being this, you know, like self-proclaimed unofficial six man to now you're like the ringleader of the six man. Like it is literally what you do. How did right. that come into being last year? Just love, man. Just um, the, the power of manifestation and speaking things into existence. Again, I remember going to late nights um, when, when Stuart Scott will host and just loving that energy. And then they, went after Stuart Scott. Unfortunately, of course, we lost Stuart. And, yeah. you know, they would have other people to fill in. And I just remember going and being so envious. Like, like I respect Anton Jameson. So, yes, I understand <laughs> why he's hosting. But he's not entertaining at all. Like, come no. on. And, you know, they would just have so many other great stars of, of Carolina lore. And I always respected that and understood that. But I just felt like the fans deserved more entertainment other than just – Roy dancing with the team during that portion. You know, like I felt like there's something else that could be here. And um, when Coach HD uh, made the change, well, when, when, when Coach HD became head coach, um, Hoots, Eric Hoots in charge of basketball operations, he, um, him and Theo Penson called me on three-way. And it was really Theo. Theo said, I might have got you late night. I said, man, don't play with me, Theo. Don't you play with me. And he called me on three-way. Um, Hoots asked me if I was available. I said, yes. And what's crazy is I'm in the exact space I was in when they called me. This was like September. No I was preparing for a comedy show and I was over here at my man's Jason's crib and I had just woke up from a nap and Theo had FaceTimed me like twice. And I hit him back. I'm like, what's up? He's like, man, why are you answering your phone? I'm like, my fault. What's up? He's like, I might've got you late night. I'm like, man, you better stop playing. <laughs> and, um, but when they, when they asked me to do late night, you know, I didn't go in just wanting to do late night. I told my manager, I told my wife and kids, I told them, I said, listen, I'm treating this like an audition. You know, I want to go in here and I want to go, I want to do so well that at the conclusion, they're like, yo, we got to get this guy in here for games. Like this guy's good. And I did that. You know, I walked in there and, you know, I remember, I'll never forget my nerves were, I had all my family and closest friends um, in the locker room um, before the, before late night. And, I went upstairs outside just to get my mind right. And I'm walking around and just thinking and just where do I want to put this? And do I want to do swag surf? And I wanted to get this tribute to Stuart Scott. And where do I want to do that? And just going through my motions. And I look over and Kerwin Walton's mom is just staring at me. And she's like, you nervous? <laughs> and I'm like, a little bit. <laughs> and she's like, you're going to do fine. And I was like, thank you, Mama Walton. And, you know, I, I get myself together and I go in there and I smoke it. I mean, it was amazing, man. Like, it was one of the best nights ever. And, um, you know, the next day, you know, I'm getting so much love from fans and players and coaches. And Coach Banghart is talking to me and, and you know, the wrestling coach, football coaches. And now wrestling is inviting me to matches and all kinds of stuff. And Hoots calls me. He's like, so how does it feel the next day? I'm like, Hoots is unreal. I said, um, different teams want me to come and possibly, you know, do what I did at late night for their programs. And da-da-da. He was like, I, I knew that would happen. He said, before you say yes to any of those organizations, um, I want you to know that our coach, HD, 
wants to know if you'd be interested in doing what you did at late night for all the home games. Man, hmm. I just I just I just couldn't stop smiling, man. I just could not stop smiling, man. And I and I didn't even believe it until the first game. I like something's gonna happen and they're gonna be like, wait a minute, he's black. Get him out of here. I didn't know what was gonna happen. I, I didn't wait a minute. He didn't graduate here. Get him out of here. I didn't know what I, I was gonna wake up and it was going, it was all a dream. I used to I didn't know what was going on. But when I got to that first game and my credentials worked and they let me in the building and I got to walk down on the floor and I'm on the floor and nobody's kicking me off, like stop playing. This is real, man. Like dream come true, man. Dream Ooh. come true. That's dream awesome. True. Good yeah. for you, brother. But, see, Love I, but, but my history, I've always hosted. I've always been an entertainer. Um, I started doing PA back in 2004 at Winston-Salem State University at my alma mater, did football there. Um, from there, I transitioned to football, basketball. Um, I worked for the Greensboro Swarm and the Charlotte Hornets, the Carolina Cobras. Um, so, you know, invigorating crowds is what I do. You know, um, uh, you know, that's just my style. That's my energy. And, you know, when I was doing work at – I never – I was never a stellar athlete growing up, but I was always on teams. You know, and, and I love I love football the most, but I love basketball and I just enjoyed that camaraderie. I love what a team does. I love what a team um, just the depending on each other and the coming together for a common um, 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 winning or, you know, I just I just always respected that. And I always understood. The energy and the effect that a crowd can have on visiting teams. Even in high school, like I remember being at basketball games and us, we would beat teams that we probably wouldn't beat. But because, you know, I'm in the stands agitating their best player or knowing them when we got chance and we're just bothering them and they're looking up in the crowd, like things like that mess up teams. And, and you really don't understand that unless you've been able to manipulate that energy. And I am a king in manipulating <laughs> that energy, man. Like and, you know, I always my take on the Dean Smith Center was, and I'm really working on that because I've always called it the Dean Dome, but hearing that um, Coach Smith didn't like the term Dean Dome, mm -hmm. um, I try to, to correct that and, and call it the Smith Center or the Dean Smith Center as much as possible. So sometimes I might mess up, but I just wanted to let my Tar Heel family know that. But <laughs> I always looked at the Smith Center as, you know, like, because they always say we got that wine and cheese crowd. We got these 80-year-olds around. And the reality is we do. We do have 80 year olds around on, on the floor that's close to the floor and whatnot. But the reality is those 80 year olds were once 18 year olds that loved cheering for the Tar Heels. Right. And that is still Absolutely. there. It's still there. And but the reality is they can't cheer for 40 minutes. So my job is to find pockets where I can get the most out of them. You know what I mean? Like, it, like I, I might not need them to scream this time out. I might just want to just have some fun and we play some games and, you know, let me just get a tar heel. But we might be down four points going into this timeout and we had to burn the timeout. So right now I need the energy up. I don't need us all sitting down nervous. Now I need the energy up. Um, I remember always going to games and, you know, at halftime, after halftime, the seats are empty and people are still in the concourse. And it used to drive me crazy, Slim. Yeah. It would drive me crazy. So, like, at halftime, the two-minute mark, I'm like, you got two minutes to get to your seats. <laughs> two minutes to get to your seats. You got 60 seconds to get to your seats. And I've actually seen it work. I've seen people running down from the concourse, getting into their seats. So by the start of the second half, we got the energy we need to, to, to propel the boys on to victory. You know, like we only lost one game in the Smith Center this season. Like I take, pride, take great pride in that. I Absolutely. take great pride in that. No, matter of fact, I think we lost two. We lost to Pitt and we lost to Duke. Pitt and Duke, two losses in yep. the in the in the um, Smith Center this year, and I take pride in that, and the fans take pride in that because we know that there were a couple of games that we almost lost, and we didn't because the crowd was just so raucous, and you know, like the six man is what the crowd is to a basketball game, and with me being the six man, that's what I personify, and that's what the brand personifies. The six man, I always say, 
the sixth man is for the lit fan. And by lit fan, <laughs> I just mean that fan that's just always excited. That fan that even – I could be at home in a room by myself, and if the Carolina game is on, I'm screaming as if I'm at the Smith Center. Like, I'm, let's go. That's what I'm talking about, Mondo. <laughs> Come on, see. I need you to get right. Now tighten up, Caleb. I need – that's how I'm talking to my television. So at a game, it's like that times a thousand. So the six man brand is for the lit fan, man. It's for fans that just love Carolina basketball, love assisting on and being that six man and helping to, you know, uh, motivate those guys to get as many dubs as possible, man. Love it. Love what this is bringing the energy, the way you're uh, bridging the generational gaps. And man, yeah, man, it just seems like it's brought such a good energy to the Smith Center. Boy, oh boy, the yeah. season turned out great. And so in just a second, we got to look at that. I want to hear your craziest moment of the year. And then I want to hear your predictions for this upcoming season in just a moment. I have a big important favor to ask of you. We at Locked On have put together a listener viewer survey to learn more about people just like you and to try to work at helping make your favorite Locked On podcast even better than before. This is your opportunity to tell us what you love about the show and what you'd like to see us improve on. So go to lockedonpodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It's not going to take you very long. And even better, everyone that completes the survey is going to be entered in a drawing for one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. Yeah, that's right. So don't hesitate. Go right now to lockedonpodcasts.com slash survey. Do it and you might win a Ticketmaster gift card. Thank you so much for your help. It is Friday. We're joined on Locked on Tar Heels by the man B-Dot. You call him Dot, the sixth man of the Tar Heels, getting your energy six, going six, inside six, the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just said three sixes. You said you're a pastor's son. Let's go. What are you I doing? Have, no, no. Well, actually, that is, that's the, not, <laughs> not the three sixes, but six, 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 six. That's the Drake uh, echo. Where, where he yes, does all yes. his OVO six. So I stole that from Drake, and I'm hoping he gets so irate that he sues me. And that would be amazing. <laughs> Can you imagine getting sued for, oh. from Drake just for saying six, 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 six? So It'd come be on, phenomenal. Drake. I love it. Let's get that publicity going. So, uh, <laughs> Dot, like the the moments you got to experience this past basketball season, like un unbelievable. When you yeah. look back on this experience, could you, <laughs> if possible, pull out like what was the craziest moment of the year for you? Oh my God. Um. Uh. In no particular order, but first would hands down be um, swinging, singing Sweet Caroline um, for late night. Um, first time on the floor, leading late uh, Sweet Caroline. And, you know, I was just ready for rah, rah, rah. I was ready for that part that we all do in unison. But as I started singing, I looked up in the upper deck and I saw some lights. Some folks had their phones out. And just right there, the improv in me, I immediately said, oh, I like that. Everybody, phones out. So now everybody's rocking with their phones out. And the entire Smith Center was lit up with phones. And it was just the most humbling feeling. Just, And I'm still just singing along. And I was just so excited. And, I, and we went, rah, rah, rah. And I remember just... Ugh. And when somebody took a picture, and the picture I'm going to get framed, the picture is actually the cover of the um, the, the six man coloring book that I'm have that I'm dropping this fall, and it's got me all on one foot screaming raw, <laughs> and it's got uh, Ramsey's over in the corner and he's on one foot raw, yes, and behind yes. us are just lights, lights, lights like we're at the planetarium. Man, it's it's like. It gives me chills just thinking about it because for years I always wanted that moment, man. For years I just always wanted the opportunity to just stand on the Dean Smith floor and just scream tar and get 21,000 people to say heels. That's it. Like, not host the game. Like, not be the PA announcer. I just wanted to get down there one time and say, tar! And the entire Smith Center say, heels! And to be able to create a position where I get to do that as many times as I want for every home game. <laughs> like it's unreal, Shay. Like I can't, I can't, I can't accurately. And for someone who considers themselves to be a wordsmith, 
Like I was spelling bee champion in third grade. I still cannot verbalize accurately how I felt in that moment. But that yeah. is top tier Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Nothing will ever um, surpass that. I don't care. Um, and then I think of games like that again that we should have lost. Like you would have had to be there. And the people that are watching that that are that are Carolina haters, they would laugh at this. But the Brown game, we played Brown early in the season, and that game, like you know, I mean, of course, supposed to be Brown with Carolina, but clearly Brown didn't get the memo. Okay, because they're in there playing <laughs> like like they're gonna win this game, and you know the guys had to fight, and that was one of yeah. the first times where the manipulation of the Smith Center actually catapulted us to win. Another time was the Michigan game. You know, Michigan they ended their season fairly lackluster, but you know uh, they came in hot, and people were expecting yeah. them to be a top tier team, and yeah. you know they were ranked high when they came to see us, and. I, I don't know. No, I don't want to say that. I, I don't remember exactly what their ranking was. They may have been unranked. I don't really remember. But I remember it was a blockbuster game, Michigan coming to Carolina. And it was another one of those games where the fans and the manipulation of that crowd catapulted the guys to win. And, you know, those two games really stick out. The Duke game, yeah. I was robbed um, because, you know, I, I never go into the locker room with the guys. You know, even though coach has said I'm part of the team and all of this, like, when they're in there celebrating, that's their space. Afterwards, I'll come in and tell them, great job or whatever. But I asked Hoots, I said, when we beat Duke, can I please celebrate in the locker room? And he said, absolutely. And, of course, we <laughs> lost to Duke, and I did not get to celebrate in the freaking locker room, so I was pissed. Um, but lastly, one of my favorite memories is, well, are the fans, man. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a black kid from – Greensboro, North Carolina, the east side, bro. Like, I, I never made the grades to go to a Carolina. I never turned my tassel in Keenan. I'm a graduate of Winston-Salem State University and HBCU. Um, so I'm not the typical person that would be the arena host for Carolina. And none of that mattered to the fans. And it was such a warm reception from the fans, um, from 8 to 80. Race didn't matter. Uh, my gender didn't matter. Like, none of that mattered. Like, I was a Tar Heel fan, like all of us. And the most important thing that I think BDOT as the sixth man represents from Carolina is inclusion. Um, mm -hmm. They show that you don't have to just be a Carolina alum to be a fan. You don't have to be um, um, white to be a fan. And, I, you know, I say that a lot, but I don't say that to turn people off that are, that are watching the locked in, but it's a real thing. Like that stigma is real. And to have someone as urban as me, like I wear my chains, I, 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 wear, I, I, I keep my swag on me for Carolina to feel so comfortable with allowing and yeah. trusting my brand yeah. on their floor. Like I'm just so genuinely appreciative. Like I cannot, I cannot thank Coach HD. I cannot thank um, Bubba Cunningham. I cannot thank King Cleary. I cannot thank Robbie. I cannot thank these people enough for trusting me with that. And for that, I take, I take it very, very serious. And you know, at the end of games, where fans will come down and you know, fans will be very transparent and say, you know, I didn't know what to expect from this whole thing because we've never, because we've never, the position no, has never it's existed new. at Carolina. It's brand new. Yep. That it's never existed, and people would just be very honest and say, I didn't know what to expect, but I'm so glad we made the decision to have you as this PA um, announcer or, or, or the arena host. Like, you are amazing at what you do. And I'm talking about 80-year-old white women, 8-year-old <laughs> white kids, 90-year-old white men, 70-year-old black women, 60-year-old black men. It did not matter. And when we're no. in the Dean Dome, none of that matters. I'm sorry, we're in the Smith Center. None of that matters. <laughs> Right. You leave the, the age biases, the gender biases, all of that foolishness is left out. We are here for a three hour job. We are here for a three hour job to give everything we've got for 40 minutes to ensure a victory for the boys. And after that, you can do whatever you want to do. But in those three <laughs> hours while we're in the Smith Center, it is that is that family. It is that go heels. It is a great day to be a Tar Heel, man. And that was definitely shown to me this season and i'm just super appreciative man love that love that love to see the carolina family come together in that Absolutely. way speaking of carolina family coming together we got some of the carolina family coming back mondo's coming back 
Caleb's coming back. RJ's coming back. Leaky's taking that COVID year. Yep. Dot, what, 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 uh, we still got this scholarship. We, we talked about Kerwin just a little bit ago. He decided to transfer out there. There's still a scholarship on the table. Matthew right. Meyer said, I don't want to be a national championship. I'm going right. to go to Illinois instead. That's a terrible move, but you know, whatever, right. bro. <laughs> what, right. what, what do you, what do you see in front of the Tar Heels for this upcoming season? If we don't, even if we don't add a scholarship, I love our chances at being at the very least where we were last year and that's competing for a national championship um i feel like puff is gonna is gonna really really leaps and bounds this year because the johnson family both have chips on their shoulders cam is very upset with how the phoenix suns ended their season yeah. puff is very disappointed in how the tar Heel season ended as well so i just really feel like both of those guys are going to be going hard in the off season and because puff has the um the asset of an older brother in the NBA, then his facilities and the things that he can use are a lot, a lot better. And I feel like he's going to be really locked in. Um, I feel like Don Trez, we're going to see the Don Trez that people boasted about last season, the athleticism and this one year of experience with him. I hope DeMarco can, um, can, can get more confidence and get more minutes and we can actually see um, the athleticism that we've been promised with him. But even with just the guys that are returning, them four studs, Caleb, RJ, Mondo, Leak, like I, I'm, I'm willing to bet the farm on those guys. And if I lose, then I didn't need that damn farm anyway. Like those guys, <laughs> those, those, like those guys know what they could have accomplished if one board would have stayed in place, or if if one ankle would have stayed hinged. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I do feel like this is going to be the toughest road we've had to a national championship yeah. since 2009. Um. You know, like, I, I don't view this team as the redeemed team. Um, nobody expected that Theo and Joel Berry team to win a national championship. Felt like we had lost too much. I remember so many pundits saying how, oh, they lost Marcus Page and Bryce Johnson. No way they'll make a run. They'll be lucky if they make the Elite Eight Sweet 16. So we got to fly under the radar a lot that season. 2009, that Danny Green and Tyler Hansburg and Ty Lawson and Wayne Ellington, that was our national championship to lose. Yeah. Like, everybody was aiming for us. Everybody knew we would win a national championship, and those boys lived up to the moment and did it. And that's what this team is going to have to do. Um, but I'm very confident that this team can do that. I'm very confident they have the right leadership with Coach HD and that beautiful staff that he's put together. That was so well crafted. Yes. Um, and I just feel like, um, you know, we're, we're, we're on top for a nice little uh, – for a nice, uh, a nice time, man. Like, we got this year <laughs> – we got GG and them boys coming in next year. Like, I mean, Seth Trimble is under 18 uh, Olympic team, or uh, USA team right now. So he's going to come in with a confidence, um, relieving Caleb at, at that point guard or RJ at that point guard. Like, I'm just loving what we got. I'm loving it. And, and I really feel like we should be in Houston next year. Love it. Friends, the future is bright for the Tar Heels, and we've got a six man who can help guide the way, bring us all together as six, one. Six, 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 six. Come on, Drake, bring that noise. Let's go. <laughs> and something else, like I, I used to all, before we get out of here, I just used to all, Ninth Wonder is a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, I just used to always be so envious of how Duke had partnered with Ninth Wonder's brand, you know, and, and just seemed so cool. And I'm just so thankful that my brand, the BDOT brand, was allowed to partner with Carolina's brand and bring some of that swag to Carolina. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's dope when, you know, Gigi Jackson, I, I saw him at the Josh Level Classic. And for him to say, you know, one of my deciding factors was when y'all swag surfing in the Smith Center. Like, and to just be able to bring that swag and to bring that, no pun intended, and to bring that energy <laughs> and, you know, just to bring that and for cats to see it and be like, oh, that's cool. I want to be a part of that. Like, I'm just so thankful. And, you know, and that's all I plan on doing moving forward is continuing to partner uh, my brand with, with with bigger national brands and continue to elevate Six Man and continue to elevate B Dot And, you know, I, Isaac, we've been trying to get this interview for a while. I'm glad we <laughs> can finally do it, man. But I appreciate yes, you for allowing me to be on your platform, man. For real, I'm locked oh. in. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you so much for taking the time. Where I know we've talked about it some, but where all can people find you? Um, B Dot. I taught you how to spell it earlier. No O, A-H. Remember, B-D-A-T. 
um and tv is for instagram b.tv is on instagram everything's b.t um the six man shirts this this initial run um was a collab with r lamar who's a huge tar heel fan does a lot of that's right tar heel content he's, he um he, he has nils with puff and rj so he's heavily locked in and this was a collabo six man r lamar collabo so you can go to r lamar clothing r lamar clothing.com and get those and in rr kicks in chapel hill so you know just working i got the coloring book coming in the fall um awesome. you know got you know i'm just just working 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 baby let's get to <laughs> it <laughs> let's do it uh b dot thank you so much for joining us it's thank always you, a great day to be a tar heel brother it's always a great day to be a tar heel tar heel well that's it for this week of locked on tar heels Thanks so much to BDOT for joining me. What a fun conversation that was. He is a dude. I love it. Next week is going to be another great week. Coach Pat Kilby and I getting back together uh, to talk about another player. Who's it going to be? Tyler Nickel. You know it. We've got another special guest. Her name is Sophia Chikalski. Uh, we're looking at some, some kick times for the football team. All sorts of great stuff. Thanks so much for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please, if you would, go ahead and subscribe to the show. If you're watching on YouTube, not only subscribe, but please, please, please smash that like button. Leave a comment. Maybe you got some questions for BDOT that you want to ask him. Uh, you can follow the show on Twitter at LockedOnHeels. You can follow me on Twitter at Isaac Shade, I-S-A-A-C-S-C-H-A-D-E. Please also go, go give BDOT a follow at BDOT, just B-D-A-H-T. Now, let me encourage you to make Locked On NBA Big Boards your second listen of the day. Rafael Barlow and the whole crew give you an in-depth look into the biggest podcast, <laughs> the biggest prospects, latest player rankings, and, of course, big boards. Follow Locked On NBA Big Board podcast every day on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and anywhere else you get podcasts. Thanks so much for spending part of your week hanging out with me, talking Carolina sports. It's been another great week. And you know what? It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until next time, peace!